Welcome back to the Athlete Hackers Podcast. My name is Chris Schrade. And I'm Mark Spellman. Uh, today, we have a gentleman that has been a big part of my life the last couple of years, one of my mentors. Uh, and as I've said in the past, I'm having an attitude of gratitude with the people that have come in into my life and helped change it and push it forward. Uh, the gentleman's name is Bill Parisi. Coach, we're going to get to you in about two seconds. Uh, first and foremost, we're going to go over our, our previous podcast, one with uh, Mark Asanovich, talking about the importance of strengthening your neck to decrease the likelihood and potential for concussions with youth athletes. Mm -hmm. um, I think a lot of people misunder or don't understand the importance of making sure that the neck and supporting uh, musculature around the neck is strong so that the athletes do not get injured. Uh, and as Mark uh, said, at a catastrophic level. Also, the five Ps of his training program. Um, so those were the big ones for me, Chris. Yeah. He, uh, the thing that really hit me with that podcast was uh, when we were talking about some of the injuries that have happened with concussions. Uh, I told a story, he told a couple stories, and he summed it up by saying, you know, he talked about his son. He won't let his son play football because of it, uh, because he doesn't want him to lose his identity. That's huge. Uh, the other um, podcast was with Coach Jeremy Tr Tromala, sorry. Um, and it had to do with training the hockey athlete. And one of my biggest takeaways from that, and we've had a couple coaches say that, is say this, is that you need to meet your athletes where they're at so that you can help them become the best version of themselves. Also, the importance of remembering when you're working with youth athletes or athletes in, in general, it's not about you, it's about them and what they need from you. Yeah, Jeremy has some really good points. Uh, he was uh, the first guest we had on who reached out to us and we put him on right away. Uh, so if you wanna be a guest, info at athletehackers.com. Uh, former Army veteran, and uh, like I said, he had a bunch of uh, good points. It's the uh, first time we touched on hockey, too, in the podcast. And for all service, service individuals that have served our country, thank you for your service and everything that you've done to protect our freedoms. Without further ado, it is my pleasure. It is my honor. He is an author. He is a president, founder of his company. He is a leader in the world of youth athletic development. He is not only a mentor, but he is a friend. Bill Parisi, how are you today? Hey, Mark, I'm doing great, man. Thank you very much for those kind words. Thanks for coming on, Bill. Thank you, Chris. Um, so a lot of people know of your success. They don't know the story behind the success, though. I mean, I, 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 I've, I've been fortunate and lucky enough to talk with you multiple times and people see the end result right now where you are pre-COVID with having over 100 facilities in the country, having worked with over 400,000 youth athletes and a lot of people want to emulate that. Before they emulate that, can you tell us the story of how you got your beginnings? Absolutely. Um, so I was an undersized high school athlete, uh, as you know, and uh, my, you know, I was a football player and my coaches in high school told me, hey, you know, go off for track. You need to get faster. So I went out for track and, um, you know, my coach there told me, hey, we're going to have you try all the events. So I tried all the events. I took a liking to the javelin. I continued to both football and, and the javelin throughout high school. And, you know, I excelled in both. It was a hard worker, you know, working out, hitting the weights, you know, doing the things you do back in the early 80s. Um, what they knew back then, did everything I could. And, uh, you know, was the captain of, of the team as a lineman. I was an offensive lineman and linebacker, actually. And, uh, and uh, the MVP. And then, you know, javelin was something I took a, a liking to, went to some camps. And I wound up, you know, doing pretty well. I was seventh in the country as a high school athlete. And my senior year, I got invited to a uh, national meet, the Keebler International, uh, uh, Keebler um, Junior Olympic Trials, I guess it was, the top two place finishers in that meet. 
uh, were selected to represent the United States in the Junior Olympics in, in Tokyo, Japan that year. And uh, I was in second place, super excited. I, I felt that USA sweatsuit, that silk sweatsuit on my body. I was hugging my coach. And then the last thrower of the meet came out and beat me by two inches. Oh. And uh, I was devastated. Two inches, the, uh, the size of a, gol <laughs> a golf tee. And I was devastated. But that, that biggest defeat turned into my biggest opportunity because I said to myself, I'm never going to let something like that happen again. Uh, I went on this quest. Uh, I went on to uh, go to Iona College in New Rochelle, New York. It's a small Irish Catholic school. And uh, they have Division I basketball, um, Division I track and field. And they had a, a very successful field events coach that was – the head track coach. I wound up getting a little bit of money as a freshman, worked my way into a full scholarship as a senior, as a javelin thrower. And uh, the head coach there, Tony Naclario, was, was uh, the Olympic um, uh, track and field throws coach in 1996. So he was at, at that level. I learned a ton from him about training. And then in my uh, sophomore year, I went to Finland because in 1988, Tapios Kuros uh, won the gold medal in the javelin. So someone once told me, um, if you want to be the best at something, find out who the best in the world is and model them. Simply, you know, it's a really simple formula. So, <laughs> you know, I, I, I connected with an with a exchange student here in America that was a Finnish javelin thrower. Kid was unbelievable. He was a high school kid. I met him when I was in college. We, we used to have these fall meets up at West Point. We used to go and compete and throw. Uh, my coach had us doing all these awesome things. And uh, he was from Finland. I said, I have to come to your country. I, I would love to come and be a, you know, you know, stay there a summer and train with you and your coach, get that experience. So I went there in 1989, flew to Finland, no cell phone. I was, you know, 19 years old. I'm going to Finland. My parents think I'm out of my mind. I put a fundraiser together to, to raise money to go there. I come from a blue collar, old school Italian family. No one went to college. I have an older brother, older sister, younger sister. Mom, dad, never, all blue collar, right? I was the only one to go to college. Uh, great family, love them, old school Italians. And um, I put a fundraiser together. I go to Finland and I'm training with some of the greatest athletes in the world. And this is 1989 and they're doing thousands of medicine ball drills a month. They're doing kettlebell movements. They're doing physio ball movements. They're doing all, all the things that's, you know, big time. Now this was 1989 and in America back then, which is 30 years ago, Every club back then was, was basically like a Planet Fitness. It was a sea of cardio equipment and all free weights and machines. And that's what every club was back in the 80s in America and even in the 90s. So I came back from that experience. And that's where I said to myself, I want to bring this performance-based training back to America because every field and court sport athlete can utilize these training techniques. And I wound up, you know, throwing about 72 meters and change, about 237. Uh, I was a two-time Division One All-American. I went to the Olympic trials. So I, I competed at a, at a decent level for a five-foot-10 Italian, right? We're not supposed to throw javelins really that far. Um, the, the, all the great throwers are six-foot-four, six-foot-six Norwegians, you know, Swedes or, or Finns, you know, really uh, Germans. I mean, these guys are real. They, they start throwing at a young age. So I, I you know, I, I, I – I felt I, I reached my potential uh, because of the training that I learned as a track athlete. And to throw the javelin really far as a five foot ten guy, you got to run down the runway really fast uh, with a <laughs> seven foot spear in your hand, right? So you're running almost as fast as you can with a seven foot spear, and you have to stop on a dime. Like you have to you have to stop and transfer all that force through your core, through your body, into the throw. So you need speed, you need strength. You need flexibility. You need power transfer. You need deceleration. You need all these things. And that's all I did for five years. I, I did a red shirt year and I just trained. That was my practice was training med balls, physio balls, kettlebells, javelin throwing, ball throwing. And I realized man, I became a pretty good athlete, you know, from doing all this where I was sinewy and athletic and got fast. And, you know, it was it was pretty good. I mean, I wound up running a four seven forty in, in high school. I was like a five one, you know? So it was interesting. And I said, that's where I said, you know, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta do something with this. So after uh, college or actually during college, believe it or not, that was my sophomore year in college during college. Um, I had this quest. I was going to seminars. I was going to NSCA events, 
Uh, there was an event in New Jersey that the head strength coach of the New York Giants uh, uh, held. Uh, he brought in Angel Spazov, who was the uh, head Bulgarian strength coach at the time. And in the 80s, the Bulgarians were winning all the Olympic lifting competitions. They probably figured out how to use drugs better than anybody else, but they were good. <laughs> they were good. Allegedly. Strength. Yeah. Allegedly. <laughs> Back in the 80s, it was crazy, right? Um, but, but. You know, they, they, they were great, and then Angel Spazov was, you know, just very knowledgeable. So the head giant strength coach brought him in for a seminar. I went to it. I was 20 at the time. I go to this seminar uh, just to learn. I'm a college student. I just want to learn. I'm going to all – I go to Lawrence Seagrave seminars. I'm going to all these seminars all over the was country. That, What's that? that? Johnny Parker? Johnny Parker, yes. Okay. Johnny Parker. So I'm sitting in the front. I'm asking questions. I'm, you know, so at lunch um, – I said, hey, can I go to lunch with you guys? It was Angel, Spazoff, and Johnny Parker. 20 years old. They're like, yeah, sure, kid. You, you know, we, we see that you're eager. You want to learn. So over lunch, we're talking. And I just got back from Finland you know, like a month ago. And um, I had one All-American season under my belt, actually, at that time. So Johnny started asking me questions. I started telling him about med ball training. And he, he's like, in his southern accent, he's like, Bill, I'm really interested in those med ball drills. I want you to come down and show Phil Sims those, those med ball exercises. So in 1989, I actually, believe it or not, I started training Phil Sims as a, as a sophomore in college uh, and, and worked with him a number of times. Uh, and then eventually, um, you know, the rest was history. But there's a little more to the story on how I got the business started, if you want me to go into that or if you want to ask me another question. Well, one of the questions, what did your mom and dad think the first time you brought home a javelin? Well, I mean, <laughs> it was, you know, I never, I didn't, uh, well, I didn't bring one home per se. Uh, they were intrigued, obviously. Uh, they didn't know much about it. But once I started competing and, uh, and winning, and then I got a bunch of college letters, you know, I was getting recruited. I got, you know, probably 30 or 40 letters because I was, uh, uh, you know, I threw over 200 feet, like, you know, 10 times my senior year. And, um, you know, those, it's a pretty good number. So it really – my sophomore year in high school, I was in both technical school. I thought I was going to be a carpenter. Yeah, I, I mean, again, my parents never said, hey, they never pushed me towards college. They were like, hey, just, just stay out of trouble. You know, old school Italian, stay out of trouble. You know, work hard and do what makes you happy. So, um, you know, I mean, sports was, was, was an avenue for me that, that really got me to, you know, eventually start the Parisi Speed School. So. Um, you know, I was very fortunate that I had great coaches and great supportive parents. I mean, my parents were very supportive. Um, so I was just very fortunate that I had great coaches. And that's where we're so passionate about how a coach can make an impact on a kid. Well, not only that, but also the courage as a 20 year old to go up to these two world class coaches. Hey, can I go to lunch with you? I mean, because you look at it nowadays, so many people are afraid to take that extra step or just make that first initial contact or reach out because they're, they're afraid that I, I guess the person's going to say no. And fear um, of rejection. And I, I, I have a mom who um, she, she's told me since I was young, you know, the answer if you ask the question. So you might as well ask the question. Yeah. You know, Absolutely. And it, actually, it actually led you to being on this podcast. Cause if I didn't ask you if you wanted to be on yeah. and be, be a little persistent about it, we will, we won't have you on. <laughs> yep. I would I would actually like you to go into a little bit more in depth about how you started the school and 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 all all the all the legwork that you've really put in to build this build and I'll I'll say build a, a dynasty build build you know something that is going to be here after you're gone. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, thank you for that. And I, 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 that's a, that's a, that's probably one of the best compliments I ever got. Um, means a lot, but yeah, you know, I, I guess the message I want to get across and I think people who tune in, they want to, you know, the takeaways, what do they really get out of that? And I want them to see some patterns that, that I've have and continue to have, uh, or success patterns. Right. I actually, uh, actually wrote a book on it. Actually, I have one right here. <laughs> You've wrote a couple books. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, this one, this one's a little, this is the success patterns that, that I've uh, put out. Um, so it's patterns that I've created um, around what, I, what I've done. So, so the whole thing with going to Finland and then going to seminars 
and then asking Johnny Parker, I continued. So when I was a senior in college, there's a guy by the name of Tom Puskas. He was, he was a phenomenal javelin thrower. Made, I think, at two or maybe three Olympic teams, U.S. Olympic teams. I think his best finish was maybe sixth or seventh at the World Championships. Threw a lot further than me. But my senior year, my, all through college, we were really close. Then my senior, he pulled away. So he went, went to University of Florida. And he was living down there. He, was doing, he didn't graduate, so he was still living and training down there. So after I graduated, I, owned, I called him up. His name was Tom. I said, Tom, I want to come move in and train with you. I don't want to give up yet. I want to move in. So I moved down to Gainesville, Florida to live and train with Tom. And that was Steve Spurrier's first year coaching the Florida Gators. Mm -hmm. I call up Steve Spurrier. I cold call Steve Spurrier. <laughs> Head coach, Florida Gator football. The, the, I, the ball coach. Yep. The whole ball coach. Yep. Uh, I, I, I cold call him. <laughs> I say, coach, this is Bill Parisi, personal trainer to Phil Sims. See, when you do these things, you got to have some type of hook. You got you to gotta have a strategy and always tell the truth, but you tell the truth favorably, right? Always tell the truth, tell the truth favorably. So you got to have a hook. So I say, coach Spur, Bill Parisi, personal trainer to Phil Sims. Would love to come down there, get a GA with your program, be able to work with your team. I went to Finland. It was all America. Come down to train with Tom. He's a student down there. He's like, who? He's like, Phil? He's like, he didn't even hear what I said. The first thing out of his mouth, how's Phil's golf game doing? You know, he wasn't like really concerned with me. He's like, he was more concerned with how Phil Sims was playing golf, you know, because he's an avid golfer. So I think, it's, I said, I think he's doing pretty good. Uh, and I said, you know, I'd love to come down. I got a lot to offer. He goes, well, I'll tell you, I, I don't make those decisions. You have to call my strength coach, Doug Kaufman, who I just hired. And uh, you have to go through him. I said, thank you, coach. So what I did then, I called up Coach Kaufman. What do you think I said? I'm, I'm calling you on the recommendation of Coach Spurrier. That's exactly what I said. <laughs> <laughs> coach, coach Kaufman, uh, Coach Spurrier told me to give you a call. Now, you think I got his attention with that? Yes. Big time. <laughs> I, I, didn't, I didn't plan that. It just worked out like that. But the pattern is you got to get comfortable being uncomfortable. You got to outreach. You got to go. And I have numerous patterns. Like I just gave a webinar for Perform Better today. There was 500 people on it. And to this day, I'm still doing the same thing. And I'll get into that because now I'm doing this whole thing with fascia. But really to close out that story – so I go down to Florida. Uh, they didn't, I didn't get anything that first semester, but I volunteered my time. I did all this. Second semester, I got a GA, got free courses. I was able to take anatomy and, and phys because I have an undergrad in, in finance, right? I mean, that helped me out. But my undergrad was in finance. So I took anatomy and all this. And I, they gave me the title of head strength coach for the track team. And the track team had three Olympians, three <laughs> future Olympians, Dennis Mitchell, was one of them, a hundred meter, you know, guy. And I was the strength coach for their track team. I mean, it was insane. Back then in 1990, they had their own private plane. You know, I remember going to a meet at the Tennessee on their plane. It was insane. So anyway, that, that was a great experience. And I'll tell everybody a story. So I'm down in Florida. I said, oh, you know what? Unfortunately, I blew out my ankle throwing my, my plant ankle slipped one time and I really screwed up my ankle and uh, couldn't get it, you know, back the right way. It was, and I, I was, you know, it just wasn't working. So I, after the year, I did my year, I moved back to New Jersey. And as I was coming back, I put together this clinic, you know, I was putting together this free uh, clinic for coaches, so high school coaches, club coaches. And, you know, I was a two-time division, division one All-American. I, I went to the Olympic trials. I went to Finland. I was the uh, strength and conditioning coach of Florida Gators track team. I helped out with football. I trained Phil Sims. The Giants had me come back and do part-time stuff in the off-season. All that on my, on my brochure to, to, for a free clinic for high school coaches. I remember I was putting stamps on letters. It was like 15 cents a stamp. I mailed 5,000 of them. It cost me a couple thousand bucks to do that mailing. Right now, you just do an email blast, cost you nothing. And a couple thousand bucks in 1991 is a lot of money, probably worth like you know, eight grand today, you know, six grand that you got to spend today. I sent out 5,000 of these flyers to get our coaches to come to this club, I had no coach show up. None. No coaches. That's how I started. Right? So I was beat down because back in 90, 91, no one thought speed can be improved. And I'm like, yeah, who is this guy? What is this? He's trying to sell a bag of goods. But I didn't stop. 
like I kept going. I had one coach that showed some interest. He just, he responded. He didn't come to the clinic. I went to him and I talked to him. He was really impressed. I gave his school a free clinic, a couple people. He told a couple coaches. Next time I ran an event, I had about 20 coaches. Blew them away, you know, to the free seminar. They told more coaches and then the rest was history. And then I started to build a brand. I was living in my parents' basement. I was driving around in a $500 van, as you know. Uh, I was 50. I was, I, was waiting, I was waiting for the van. Yep, $500 <laughs> van. Uh, I think I have a picture of the van. And then um, I was, uh, um, you know, just working and, and, and doing everything. So there's a picture of Phil in, uh, uh, back in the day, right? Uh, I'm lean, go. he's lean. You know, there's a lot of – that's me working with the, with the New York Giants, one of the receivers uh, at the complex. Look at that long hair. Yeah, that's some good flow. That's good flow. <laughs> that's good flow, right? Look at that flow. You um, might have been a hockey player. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> or lacrosse. Uh, that's the University of Florida um, um, program book for the track team. And that was – it was really interesting. Um, <laughs> but – but and this is, uh, this is Tom on the cover of uh, – Track and Field News, Tom Puskas, American Spear King. So a lot of uh, interesting times. But the point was, when I came back um, and I started running these clinics, I just kept to it. And I had really good information about improving speed and injury resiliency. And I just kept giving free clinics, education, just providing. And people started talking about it. And more people knew, more people had more kids come, more kids come. And I'm working out of the van, renting fields, renting tennis courts. And then eventually, you know, I saved up a, a little bit of money and, and we were, that was 1993 when we were in a recession right after the Iraq war during that time. And um, it wasn't a good economic environment. And there was a local small little gym in Wyckoff, New Jersey that went out of business. And I renegotiated the lease with the landlord. It was padlocks on the door. And, you know, that's a scary time, kind of like now, you know, it's a scary time. It's the worst time to be in the industry and it's the best time to be in the industry. Let me say that again. It's the worst time and the best time. It's, it's, it's the best time if you're looking to get in and get something started because there's tons of opportunities out there, tons of opportunities. So it's no, risk, like no the, reward. Yeah. It's kind of like when the stock market is crashing, Warren Buffett, that's worth a hundred billion dollars, I think, or close to it. He says, when everyone else is scared, get greedy. And when everyone else is greedy, get scared. Mm -hmm. So when the market's flying high and it's like, everybody's buying, you should be selling. When the market's dumping and everybody's freaked out and it's crashing, you should be buying. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and that's really how you create wealth. And even like times like today, you have to be smart and you have to be strategic. And I got in on, on a down cycle and, uh, and that's, that's how it started. So I got in on that down cycle. We were in a correction. Uh, the industry was losing clubs, meaning we had, you know, more clubs go away than come on that year. Uh, like, like, like 2020 is going to be. Like we'll have, you know, before 2020, the last bunch of years, we had new clubs opening all the time. I think U.S. has like 36,000 health clubs and, you know, it's been growing every year for the last 10 plus years. Guess what? We're probably going to lose a couple thousand health clubs. They're going to go out of business and it's a scary time. But, you know, you got to really uh, you got to have a lot of guts to be able to get in uh, at these times. But you got to be smart. So that's that's how it started. And and that's how our first facility uh, got going. That was 1993. And by 1997, that 3,000 square foot facility did $927,000 in sales uh, in one year. It was the highest grossing facility in the country per square foot for 3,000 square feet. And that was 23 years ago. We did those kind of numbers. Um, yeah, you'd, you'd, that was, be lucky, you'd, be, you'd be lucky for a facility to do those numbers now. Oh, yeah. You'll be, you'll be raging. Um, and then we you know, I parlayed that into a multiple uh, new facilities and, and company-owned facilities. We, we had four facilities at one point, all company-owned, that were average size. We went to 20,000 square feet, our second facility. Our third, which is Fairlawn, which you know is 30,000 square feet. Then we opened up a fourth in Morristown, New, uh, Morris Plains, New Jersey, was another you know 30,000 square foot facility. And that happened all through uh, the early 2000s and in 2000. Uh, five, we decided to license, but we, we've been doing it almost 15 years before we said, Hey, you know, let's, let's license this or let's, you know, franchise this. We had a lot of, a lot of experience and I made a lot of mistakes along the way, by the way, I, I, I made a lot of, a lot of mistakes and that's expensive experience, right? I mean, I made the mistakes. Why people get involved with us for a license is for inexpensive experience, right? You pay a couple grand a year and you get all this experience, you get all this this uh, knowledge and, and resources, and uh, that's called inexpensive experience where you're not making the mistakes.
There's a couple Coach. things I'd like. Uh, go ahead, Chris. Um, I was going to ask you uh, what, uh, well, the first thing an athlete needs to have if they're going to come to your school and get, get faster is desire. That's, that's probably the first prerequisite. They have to want it. Uh, but once they get past that point, what can an athlete expect coming to your school? Yeah, that's interesting. I got to tell you, um, we, we do, obviously, we're probably one of the largest, I think, probably in the world in terms of footprint and the amount of kids we train and, and whatnot and doing it for 30 years now. So what's interesting when, when the parent really is the customer, the, the child is the consumer. Um, so usually it's the parents that seek us out. So when the kid initially gets there, he doesn't even, a lot of times, you know, and, and we're talking, you know, younger kids, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, even 13. Uh, the high school kids, if they're coming in for the first time, they kind of get it. Mm. Uh, but those younger kids, and even sometimes some, you know, younger kids, you know, might be a freshman or whatever. Um, they don't know what's going on. They don't know why they're there. They're not excited to be there. But after they do the first session with us and how we really in, in, empower them and, and inspire them, but give them real sound techniques, even in one session, they're moving uh, more fluently. They're moving with, with less effort. They feel faster, lighter on their feet you know, where they're active dynamic warm up and our movement skill training all. So they're leaving after the first session. Holy cow, uh, my body in one session, I feel so much different. That's where we kids get turned on and they get excited because that competence, it's a new level of competency. So they feel more confident in their skin after one session because they feel more competent as an athlete. They can run faster. In one session, they feel faster. Now, are they actually faster in the stopwatch? Probably a little for sure. Uh, are they are they running just as fast with a lot less effort? Absolutely, um, and they 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 gain this this desire to even grow more. And we always say competency builds confidence. So if you improve a competency, you build confidence. So we get a lot of different kids. We get average kids. We get unathletic kids. We get athletic kids. Uh, we get high level kids. And it's the pyramid, and it's the same, right? So down at the bottom of the pyramid, there's a lot of you know average kids, right? That bottom, we get a lot of those. That's a big part of our client. As you go up that pyramid, more athletic kids. So I look at this bottom, that, that seven to 14 age group, there's 40 million kids that play organized sports at that bottom, seven to 14, right? A lot of them are average athletically. Then you move up, they'll chain a little bit. You got your high school athletes is about 8 million or so high school athletes. That's a big cutoff. You know, you're cutting off 30 million kids. Yeah. So you're looking at like 75% of kids are done with sports after 14. It goes from 40 million to 8 million, right? And now they get a little bit more athletic. That's the you know, higher level of that pyramid. Then you got your higher level peak, which are your college and pro athletes, which is probably 5% of our business. So, um, you know, understanding the psychology of these kids and our goal with that bottom of the pyramid, our goal is to make every one of those kids in that age group a competitive uh, high school athlete. Mm -hmm. uh, that's really the, the mission and the goal. Uh, because those are some of the best times in, in everyone's life, you know, high school sports that that it's hard to top that if you're uh, if you max it out, you know, yeah. uh, and that's where a lot of memories are created and you cherish them for a lifetime. And I know pro athletes that that say, hey, man, some of the best times was high school, you know. Yeah. So, um, you know, it's uh, it's a it's a famous cliche in sports that speed kills. And it does. Um, it, and th this might be coming from my own ignorance, but I almost feel like it, it, it seems like football and track athletes are more concerned with their speed. When I was playing basketball, no one, no one worked on their speed as a, a skill, as something to improve. Do you see that it's mainly you're teaching football and track athletes, or is it starting to become more diversified where – parents and athletes of different sports are starting to see that, you know, I've got to build my speed as a skill as just one part of, of the whole of being, becoming an athlete. It's an interesting question. I, I, I really have a, uh, a very detailed scientific answer to that. Um, yeah. Basketball are the athletes that probably uh, the fewest amount of basketball players will actually probably go into a, a gym or a program like this. And the reason for that is, they're always playing basketball and that's a, a two hour change of direction session almost every day. Right. And when you look at most basketball players, they're lean. Uh, most of them are, are fairly quick. I mean, you, you know, why? Because they're, they're putting forces uh, 
through their body in multi directions. And that's a lot of training. And really what's being trained when these basketball players are playing so much, it's not so much their, their muscular system, but it's really their connective tissue system, their fascia system. And I've done a tremendous amount of research over the last five years on the fascia system and why basketball players, why these lean athletes, and not just basketball, but why this really lean defensive back or wide receiver that looks like they have very little muscle uh, can run so fast. And, you know, you know, some of these basketball players, my son started to play competitive basketball in eighth grade, and he made a very competitive team called the Players here in New Jersey. It's the same team Kobe Bryant played for and Tim Thomas when they were back. It's a, you know, it's an AAU, Nike AAU organization. And I went to a few tournaments with them and these were eighth graders. And I was like, holy cow, we went into some of these gyms and there's, you know, these tournaments that Nike sponsors, there might be like 15 or 50 basketball courts all playing. And I'm seeing these 14 year old kids play above the rim, like athleticism I've never seen before by so many young kids. Hmm. And, and then forget about the 15, 16, 17 year olds. I mean, they, they were just incredible. Yeah. And most of these kids were on to D1 scholarships or, you know, playing college, you know, because the AAU at that level where if you don't pay, they, Nike pays for it all. You know, it's fairly competitive. I realized, I said, wow, all these kids, I never seen athleticism. Like so many kids assembled in one facility, you know, five, 600, a thousand kids, all incredible. Um, and they all just play basketball. And that was a big uh, paradigm shift for me because I realized, you know, there's something different going on in the body. And, and once I did the research and I wrote a book called fascia training uh, and I did a deep dive into fascia, I realized, you know, it's the fascia system, the connective tissue system. And to really give you a simple example, you know, different athletes have different drivers. So LeBron James is a muscular athlete, right? Mm. His, his physiological homeostatic driver is more muscle, right? Uh, Kevin Durant is a connective tissue athlete. He, his homeostatic, his drivers are more fascia connective tissue. Just look at their bodies, right? And different athletes. So you look at the football athlete, most of your defensive backs, your wide receivers, they're more cheetahs. They're, they're fascia connective tissue driven. Your linebackers are more like rhinos. They're a combo. They're muscular and fascia driven. Your linemen are more like elephants, really strong, slow, very muscular driven. So you know, understanding what the homeostatic drivers in an athlete is very, very important. And knowing how to train the connective tissue system is very important. So I've got a number of books, uh, out, uh, one out, more coming out on this. I just gave a, a two hour lecture to perform better today on, on this. And uh, it's really quite amazing. Fascia has 10 times more of the proprioceptors than muscle. Uh, it's considered a living, uh, uh, and uh, it's considered a, a newly discovered organ in the human body. Uh, we talk about training the muscular system, the rest, uh, the cardiorespiratory system, uh, we the nervous system. Well, guess what? The fascia and connective tissue system is just as important as any of those three systems. And you need to know how to train it and you need to respect it because the majority of the time, and this is all proven by research, by the way, the majority of the time, it's the connective tissue, the fascia is what gets injured in athletes, whether it be muscle uh, uh, hamstring pulls or whatnot tweaks you know a majority is connective tissue driven so how does it differ the training for fascia from muscle or the cardio system so here's a best way to kind of explain it is it uh, and i'll give it to you in really easy layman's terms with a question and um <laughs> I, I, I think a great way to learn is to challenge your mind so if i had a wrestling match going on and i had two kids there and they would say they both were the exact same weight, say 182 pounds. And they both had the exact same technique, both same weight. And technically the, the aptitude of, 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 as a wrestler was exactly the same technical aptitude. But one kid grew up on a farm. He was a farm boy, did chores his whole life. He's got that farm boy strength, not too cut, but strong. When that kid grabs you, it's like you never felt like anything like that before. The other kid grew up in a city and he worked out in the gym his whole life. Who are you betting on to win that? that farm wrestling? boy, farm boy all day. Farm boy all day. <laughs> now the farm boy never really lifted weights. What did he do? Did natural movements. 
He did, and, yep, and, and this is how we classify it. It's called omnidirectional submaximal loading movements. Omnidirectional submaximal loading. It, a lot of it's called chores. Um, <laughs> but what, what he did, what he did uh, in doing those chores, he built his fascia and connective tissue, tissue system. Um, along, you know, with muscle, of course, but he's not as cut and he might not be able to, you know, bench as much. Uh, he probably can bench a lot, but maybe, but he never really benched before. If he learned the patterns and he'd probably bench a whole bunch, but it's connective tissue system. So fascia is cellophane wrapping. Um, you know, up until a couple of years ago, most surgeons and still today think this fascia is just some packing material. Like you get in a, your Amazon delivery box where you get a small little thing. Like people thought it was packing material inside the human body. It has 10 times more the proprioceptors than muscle. And it plays a very big role to give our muscles stability and integrity. And it acts as a, as a, as a, you know, in vivo kind of hydraulic system in our body that facilitates co-contraction. And at the same time creates stability. What do I mean? Well, what does a power lifter wear when he goes to a bench press competition? He wears a bench press shirt that takes like three guys to put it on him. And what does that bench press sh shirt do? It gives him that elastic recoil. That's exactly what fascia does. So when you say, uh, I think the term was omnidirectional. Yes. Uh, it's, you, it's something that's less linear than your typical muscular exercise movement. Yeah, yeah, that is correct. Most movements in the gym are uh, sagittal plane movements, which uh, fascia training is, is omnidirectional. It's medicine ball training. It's viper training. Uh, it's it's, it's multi-directions at different speeds. I, Mark, Mark can attest to this. I've always argued that something like jiu-jitsu or wrestling is the absolute best workout you can get because you are receiving resistance from different angles that you can't you can't account for you have to react to them but you know the the, the pressure and, and and the resistance that's coming in are at angles that are it, it's it's not the same as in in the gym it, that's exactly right you're dead on you're developing your connective tissue fascia system and what do you think's happening with basketball what are they doing two hours so ago? so like you were saying they're running they're jumping they're changing the directions there there's all these different planes of motion that they're running and meeting resistance in. and that's why they developed this athletic system because they're doing over now their muscles aren't necessarily getting stronger and they still can benefit from traditional training you know getting you know, eccentrically strong and, and, and balancing out and doing certain lifts to, to maintain stability and, and health. Um, but they're doing, you know, the, the sport itself just provides so much training, such as basketball, wrestling, you know, those are sports that omnidirectional and that's where, you know, it's funny, you know, what, what players that are really great athletes, how many tight ends, I mean, you know, can, can leave basketball, go play in the NFL. Like LeBron James could, like there's so many basketball players that can go play in the NFL. There's probably a bunch of wrestlers too. You know, when you look at like a lot of great offensive linemen, they were like former great heavyweights, you know? Um, and they, it, it's really interesting. And this connective tissue system is the reason, and this is fairly conclusive. I mean, I sit on the board of directors of the Fashion Research Society. I've run uh, unembalmed uh, human cadaver dissection courses for the NFL. Uh, I've done an extremely deep dive. So what I did with speed training and what I did with uh, my seminars, like I did in the beginning 30 years ago, I've done the last five years with fascia. Uh, and I've interviewed the top people in the world and I've, uh, and then and wrote a book and now I'm, I'm dialoguing with some of the greatest. There's a guy named Robert Schleip from Germany. He's one of the founding fathers of this fashion industry. Uh, he's put out the, the, probably the most amount of, our research or, or, or been the biggest, um, I can say, uh, uh, collaborator uh, in the world of fascia and, and also has built relationships with the top researchers. So uh, Thomas Roller is a, is a world-class, uh, world champion javelin thrower from Germany. He actually did some ultrasound on Thomas Roller not too long ago on his right uh, anterior pec. And the thickness of his fascia in its pec was three millimeters. That thickness is an aponeurosis, basically like the bottom of your foot. The fascia on the bottom of your foot, you know, we have fascia plantaitis. You know, that's a thick layer of fascia on the bottom of your foot. It's, you know, that, what does it do? It protects, it's cushioning, it's all this stuff. It's connected collagen tissue. Well, this javelin thrower had this in his anterior pec because what does he do all the time? 
He throws balls, med balls, javelins for years upon years. Great throwers. Chapman, the pitcher that throws 105 miles an hour, I guarantee if you ultrasound that guy's chest, he's got an aponeurosis, a layer of fascia, almost like, you know, like your IT band, bottom of your foot. That stuff's right along here. That's how that dude's throwing so far. And the, the real conclusive study was when they studied kangaroos and they put gas masks on kangaroos when they realized we used to think fast twitch, muscle fiber, slow twitch. Well, kangaroos and koala, koala bears have the same type of muscle fiber. Why do kangaroos can jump 30 feet? Well, when they realized they put energy expenditure uh, measurements on the, on the kangaroos and they walked you know, a quarter mile they burn more energy walking a quarter mile than they did hopping a quarter mile because that stored elastic energy in their Achilles tendon is free energy. It's non-caloric dependent. And now we know the power, the explosiveness comes from the connective tissue system. It's facilitated by the muscular system. If I use a bow and arrow, I need my muscle to pull that arrow back. But when I let go, it's that stored elastic energy in that arrow. And we're realizing and research studies show now uh, when we do different dynamic movements, specific jumping movements and whatnot, uh, the muscular system is more of an isometric. It plays more of an isometric contraction uh, than we thought. And the connective tissue, the Achilles tendon and the patella tendon and other connective tissue systems play a much bigger role in why we can jump high and run real fast. So it's almost like playing something like basketball or jujitsu or wrestling is the best way to chain, uh, train the, the fascia system. But going back to the original uh, where we started before we got into this about other sports coming and training their, their, their speed with you, I almost feel like uh, they could – there are certain athletes that I played with that they were incredible athletes because that's all they did was – play basketball but their movements were dangerous and they got injured a lot I'd, I'd say I'm probably one of those because I wasn't taught the proper ways and how to position my body or do things so I, I think there's there's still credence in being able to come to a speed school no matter what absolutely what you're playing to yeah. learn the mechanics well, that, that, that's where there's imbalances that occur. And that's what a performance school really needs to do is balance that person out. Like they would benefit greatly from an active dynamic warm-up. They would benefit greatly to learn how to fire their glute medius and create this stable and fire the stabilizers of the hips, uh, get the proprioceptors uh, in the feet and ankle fired up. They're always in these big, you know, $150 shoes that mm. you, they never get their feet a chance to get strong. So yeah, coming to a training facility is gonna prolong their career. It's gonna help them reach their potential, absolutely. So, you know, yeah, I think, I think but you don't wanna come in there and put a basketball athlete on your traditional program. You know, that needs to be more customized. It needs to really be prehabilitation, right? Prehab, right? So you're really getting that athlete and understanding his deficiencies. We have a relationship with uh, Sparta Science, which is a force platform company. We have one in Fairlawn, I've used it a lot. And we measure athletes uh, on a force plate and look at their vertical jump and look at their three phases of the jump, their eccentric loading phase, their, their transition, and then, and then their concentric phase, and then how well they drive through the concentric phase. And we can actually identify where the deficiencies lie, whether it be an anterior deficiency, uh, anterior chain deficiency, a posterior chain deficiency, or, or a leaks out of the core when they jump and uh, identify where the weaknesses are. Because most of the time, there's an imbalance between core strength, uh, hip stability, posterior chain strength, anterior chain strength. And the, the, the risk is, is once those things are out of balance, uh, your, your chance of injury is very high. This has been proven by Sparta Science, a Palo Alto software company uh, that does, does, does this in a big, big way for the US military. And uh, they're in about 100 different professional organizations right now. So we have, a, we have a great partnership with those guys and we've done, you know, we've done some, some of our own research using this technology to assess this stuff, but fascia plays a role in, in this whole thing as well. Um, they've gotten some great results with athletes that have uh, poor drive, which is their ability to express concentric force. Uh, great results with overhead squatting to, uh, you know, get that uh, superficial back line of the fascia 
uh, dialed into that, in, into that uh, you know, obviously extension forces into the ground. Because when an athlete jumps, you know, they either have one of three areas of weakness. They either have poor eccentric loading, which is an anterior chain weakness. They either have posterior chain uh, weakness where they don't really have the ability to drive or they have weak core where they leak energy out of the core and they can't transition fast. You know, they can't transition from eccentric to concentric. They get stuck in mud uh, because they leak energy out of the core. So there's been a tremendous amount of research around this that I've you know, done a deep dive into. So what did I do when I learned about Sparta Science? What do you think I did? Called up the founder, Phil Wagner, who's a medical doctor, by the way. I mean, this dude is a strength coach. He was always a strength coach. Then he realized, you know, there's not a lot of science behind injury resilience. I, I, I'm going to go get my MD to become a better strength coach. That's what this guy did. Went to USC, got his MD, and then uh, raised $20 million and started a software company to measure vertical jump on a force platform to identify injury risk. And now it's 10 years later, and he's got some real interesting data, which, by the way, is, uh, uh, which is the exclusive uh, uh, testing uh, um, protocol at the NFL Combine for the last three years to, to measure injury risk. So anyway, um, I call him up. I go out there for a week, and I hang with his programmers and his scientists to learn everything I can about it. And then I get, I get a platform for Fairlawn. So, you know, what I do when there's something good out there, I will attack it. I mean, I will go to where it's at. I will travel like I did to Finland when I was 19 years old. I'm still doing that. Um, you know, I, I, I'm just like, I'm all over the place with flying to people. Like I, I went to go see Tom Mar I got into fascia. I went up to, uh, up to uh, Vermont, uh, not Vermont, but um, uh, Rhode, not Rhode Island. Wait, is he in Rhode Island? Wherever it was. <laughs> yeah. I, I forget. And I, I, spent, I spent the day with him. And uh, took a bunch of his courses, you know, took his, his five-day dissection course, his, his cadaver dissection course. So just, I guess the point is, for your listeners, you know, I'm 53 years old. I'm in the business 30 years. People might think, uh, you know, hey, I probably know a decent amount about speed. I act like I know nothing. I act like I don't know any. I attack every day. I'm attacking. What, what can I learn? That doesn't mean I'm changing my views. You know, I, I don't change my views. So it takes me a long time to get behind something. So I know like, you know, five, 10 years ago, squats are great. Now squats are no good. And, you know, the back and this. And, you know, you got all these guys that are saying, you know, they'll change their viewpoints every three, four, five years based on the research. At the Parisi Speed School, we don't change our views. Like we, we, we do stuff that we know is sound and we stick with it. We don't say anything for a long time until the research is conclusive then we jump on the bandwagon or we'll, we'll jump into like fascia. I'm probably one of the first to really jump into this fascia thing. Uh, and we're touting it and touting it hard because it's really hard science, hard science where guys like Stu McGill, guys like, you know, Robert Schleip, Tom Finley, these are incredible, respected, super high level researchers that are also practitioners. And that, that's the difference. Uh, um, Stu McGill, He's a researcher. He's published 350 research articles, but he's also a practitioner. He trains and he's worked with some of the greatest athletes in the world, athletes that he can't even mention. Uh, some that I know of that, that I can't even mention that, I mean, that he's just, you know, he actually is a practitioner as well, a researcher. Tom Finley, Robert Schleip in the world of fashion. These guys are practitioners in managing soft tissue. They're licensed rolfers. They're licensed massage therapists and they're researchers. So they, they get their hands on people. They know what, what it's like and, and how to break up fascia and, and really what's happening at the cellular level. So um, th those are the cats I like to hang with. There's a couple things that I need, because I've been quiet for way too long. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not normal. There, yeah, well, I mean, you all were going at it, so I wasn't going to get involved. Um, I think what, the main thing that you just said about it being supported by science and research yourself and coach Asanovich big on you got to follow the science you got to follow the research you have to have that research that supports what you do the other thing like you said you've been doing this for 30 years and you got into something new and you've deep dove into it and it's not only, it's probably not changed your views on training, but it helps supported what you believe you are doing. 
And I think a lot of people need to understand when you, when you look at something new, not only take the good with it, but also look at something that's going to oppose your current views and challenge what you believe in to not only make what you believe better, but also maybe change how you view things. Yeah. You know, and, and, and I, I think, I don't think enough people in our profession do it. Um, I think a lot of people stay on, stay on the course of what, you know, what I did in, in what I did 10 years ago, I should still be doing, you know, Mike Boyle, Mike Boyle has a great, 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 great quote. Tell me what the exercise is today. And I'll tell you what it was 30 years ago, you know, and, and, and I find that very true. Um, the, the one thing I really want to hit on with you because it was so, um, important to me is the importance of you having a mission statement. Um, you know, when I came to you six years ago, I had lost my job twice as a collegiate strength and conditioning coach. And I was lucky enough to become a program director uh, for the Parisi Speed School at the New Canaan YMCA. In order to become a program director, you need to go to a four day uh, course to learn the methodology. What really happens is you get your butt kicked by, um, <laughs> by a, a senior director. Um, in my case, it was Steve Leo, um, who is phenomenal at what he does. But um, the mission statement, uh, you end the program, everybody has to develop their own mission statement and they have to say it for memory in front of the rest of the coaches that are with them. So, my mission statement that I had six years ago is still the mission statement I have. It's to be the best fa father and husband I can be on a daily basis while providing the highest level of care or training for the teens and athletes that I work with so they can become the best version of themselves. The mission statement for the Parisi Speed School is, as an industry leader in performance enhancement, we will continue to deliver a positive training experience that improves the speed of movement and strengthen character regardless of ability or economic status. And I want everybody to understand what I just said. I also want everybody to understand uh, with our correspondence with uh, Bill today, he has a, a, a thing at the end of his heading that says, he wants to change the world one child at a time. Understand what kind of undertaking that is. Today in, in our society, the number one issue with our youth is obesity. It's the number one issue. Probably number two is mental health. And I believe if you can get your children to be more active and more healthy, to embody that self-confidence and become more confident in who they are and what kind of person they can be. They'll have a fuller and more um, enjoyable life, to be honest with you. So Bill, if you want to touch a little bit on your mission statement and what you're trying to do to not only help the people that are currently uh, in your programs, but what you're trying to do on a national and worldwide level. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Mark. And I appreciate you sharing that. Yeah. Our, our mission statement is really the foundation of who we are um, in terms of, you know, we're not in the sports performance training business. We're not in the fitness business. We're not in the athletic development business. We're in the business of developing young people to have confidence and higher self-esteem. That that's, that's our core product. And, and we deliver that by improving physical competencies and building relationships with athletes. And, and that's, that's paramount. That is, that is principle centered for us. That is the foundation. That's who we are. It's not about ego. It's not about, you know, training the scholarship athlete or the stud high school kid. I mean, we want to get a middle school kid, a grade school kid excited to want to play in high school, you know, or to just want to compete. Get them excited to compete, whether it be, it doesn't have to be high school. It could be a, a town rec team, a town rec team. We want to get them to come and believe in them because there are so many challenges in sports today. I, I, I feel so many people leave sports unsatisfied. Like how many people say, oh man, 
I had this coach, or I didn't get a fair shot, or I didn't play enough, or, I mean, that's prevalent in sports today. Parents are like, you know, upset with coaches, and I'm not getting a fair, it's a, it's a tough gig. So, I mean, in the training world, if we can get kids to understand that, you know, everybody trains, everybody wins, everybody, you know, succeeds when they train, because they're getting better, and they're measuring amongst themselves. You know, there's a lot of uncontrollables out on the athletic field. There's a lot of things athletes don't control. They don't control the weather. They don't control the competition. They don't control their coach. They don't control how the ball roll, rolls. A lot of uncontrollables. The only thing you can control are your own controllables, like what, what you do and how you improve and how you go about every single day. And our mission statement says that, it, you know, regardless of someone's ability or economic status, you know, it's all about helping every kid out there, no matter who they are, what ability they are, uh, what ethnic background they are, no matter what it is. It's, it's, it's about getting a kid fired up to get fit, uh, improve their competencies, improve their speed, improve their endurance, improve their movement, you know, skills to, to do what? They're, they're more fit. They're more, they're more confident. You know, they're more confident. And then, and then they're going to go and hone their sports skills and hopefully feel better playing the sport and then lead and have that lead them on to the next endeavor in their life. You know, use those same principles, the same work ethic, the same relationship building that we hopefully we taught them to, to do that in their job with their families, to be good fathers, to be good sons, sisters, moms, you know, daughters, whatever. whatever. Um, that's really what drives us every single day. And I think that's, uh, that's missing sometimes in our industry uh, that we really don't know we really think it's about the science and about the training. Now, don't get me wrong. You just heard me for an hour. I love the science. Like I, I'm into the science. I'll go, I'll talk all day. You know, I mean, I'll go, I'll go deep with you in science, but, but peel the onion back, baby. It, it's about improving a kid's self-esteem and all this science, all this stuff, that's all cool. And that's fun, but that's just uh, the strategy. You know, the, the real, the real outcome, the real product, the real delivery is that confidence piece and that self-esteem and that relationship you build with your athlete. I mean, we're just, these are just vehicles, you know, the training tools, the, the drills, the exercises, the, the information, that's just the, that's just the vehicle, right? Just like getting fast is, is the vehicle. Eventually you're not going to be fast. Eventually we all get old. Eventually sports goes away. You're not going to compete. You know, then, then what do we got left? We, we got, we got our own kind of, you know, our, our mindset, you know, what, what do we develop, you know, those habits that we've created, hopefully Parisi Speed School is creating positive habits for kids, positive work ethic, camaraderie, teamwork, effort, self-discipline, all those things, big part of our program. And Mark, yeah, you went through the program and you, you know how serious we take that. And our mission statement is the foundation to that. I think uh, what you touch on, you know, everybody who's involved with sports has to take that into account coaches parents or we're, we're all competitive I mean especially if you're an athlete you, you've got a competitive drive that that doesn't go away but the whole vehicle as you described of sports is really for us to challenge our young to get them to see that through challenges and hard work they can become more by themselves and then at some point, we can set them off. But they've got to go through that struggle. They've got to see, they've got to build that confidence by seeing that they can get better themselves. And then eventually, someday, they can be released into the world and they're going to continue with that. And that's what sports is. Yep, yep. And, and, and you know, so, so many coaches need to kind of really understand that. And so we've done a deep dive with sports psychologists, Positive Coaches Alliance based out of Stanford, university they have a lot of great content on everything that that we're doing actually back in 2000 is where we start you know created when we created our, our mission statement um and doing a lot of work with uh with those guys uh phil jackson who won 11 uh, nba championships uh is one of the key spokesperson i mean that that dude the goat. To, yeah the goat knew how to you know, motivate basketball <laughs> nba basketball players which i think probably would be the hardest athletes to try to motivate and come together you know, he won 11 NBA. I think it's 11, 10 or 11 NBA championships. You I know only do it if you're in a Zen master. That's it. That's the exactly. only, you got to be a Zen master to accomplish that. Exactly. I mean, John Wooden and Phil Jackson, these are all the guys that are the foundation of, 
of the Positive Coaches Alliance, which is a nonprofit organization that has some really incredible content on all the things we're talking about. And, you know, so, so you know, when, when, when we really started thinking about this as an organization back in the late 90s, you know, I, I started doing some research and, um, and John Wooden was one of the guys, you know, legendary, you know, I think he was 11 US, UCLA championships. And, uh, you know, it was all about building, building kids up, you know, I mean, at the end of the day, it's, it's not about, you know, at, it really, it's not about the win and losses. It's, it's really about that you make that, that person, not just a better athlete, but a better person. Um, and, and, you know, that's, so that's where we, you know, we, we got a lot of our insight from, and it really caused us to really think and sit back and take time to put together our mission statement. And we do a lot of, you know, staff development and, and just corporate strategy, not just on, on business, uh, strategy, but really personal development strategy. Uh, how do we develop ourselves as better coaches, our communication styles, our, uh, having more empathy. Uh, understanding body language, understanding the, the communication is, is, is more about your, your physiology than anything else. Your body language is, is, is more important than sometimes what you say and, and your tonality. So we talk a lot about that, you know, tonality when you communicate. These are all, these are all strategies on how to, how to inspire and motivate kids. And you got to look at all these different things uh, when you're coaching uh, to, to really get kids to to respond. Um, you have to be a great listener, you know, you, you have to, and these are all skills, you know, you're not just born a great listener. You know, you gotta, you gotta, first of all, you gotta realize these are skills, being a great listener, uh, understanding communication, tonality, body, body language, and, and, and the words that we use and choose. And these are all practice skills. These are behaviors. So the last thing I'll say about, about this, and, and, and you'll, you'll probably think I'm nuts. So, when I started diving into this and we wanted to license the Parisi um, information, I said to myself, okay, I got to find someone that can help me package this. So I was referred to a guy, a consultant, a business consultant. And this guy by trade is a behavioral scientist. He has his PhD in educational psychology um, and really smart guy. And before he, he started his own consulting firm, he actually worked for Marriott Hotels and he was handpicked by Mr. Marriott. 30 years ago, handpicked, he reported to Mr. Marriott, and he was in charge of building out all the training and development for all the Marriott hotels, all their front desk staff, all their salespeople, and he, he, he built them out, and what he did was he built three tractor trailers. Uh, inside the tractor trailers were, were mock front desks of Marriott hotels. They would drive around these tractor trailers to all the Marriott hotels, and they would do front desk training uh, in the parking lot because he understood he had to get behavioral change. So this guy eventually started his own consulting company. I hired him for Parisi to work with us to develop my educational platform. And I took a second mortgage out of my house. I took a second mortgage for $150,000. That was his price tag to consult with me for a year and build this out. And I was just one of his clients. Long story short, I was so impressed after that year, uh, I kept him on as a consultant and that was 2006, 2012, I made him my COO because he retired from everything else. He had enough money and he came and worked for me for pennies on the dollar. And then uh, eventually was my CEO. And he said, I got five years left, Bill, then I'm going to retire again. So he's my CEO from, from 14 to 19. And now he's back as a consultant. So just, again, finding the best in the world. And we built out all of our education, all this stuff I'm talking about. Uh, with the help of this guy to help coaches change and modify behavior to make these connections. So all the things we just discussed is all embedded in our education, uh, you know, throughout what we do. So that's a whole nother dimension. So I can deep dive in science and fascia and training, um, but we also can deep dive in the delivery of that information and how it's delivered, and how you how you empower the art of coaching, if you will. So we have we have educational modules that actually teach you. These are these are learned skills. You know, you know, being a great coach is not just about the science and the information and the sets and reps and exercises. It's about how you deliver it. And those are skills and they can be taught. Awesome. On, and, and, and with, with that, I mean, we all know the quote, nobody cares how much you know until they know how much you care. Yep. Um, the other, the other great one is, um, you know, get, get comfortable being uncomfortable. Yep. I mean, and, and these are quotes that are, are, are standard. Um, the thing that, you know, we do love, 
and, uh, and uh, as we work with athletes, we do like winning championships. But like you said, it's about the life lessons. It's the fact that I can look, I can look and see my athletes being good husbands, good wives, good fathers, good mothers, and that they're being a productive member of society. I love championship rings. I love championship banners. I like celebrating success as much as anybody. But if I can see, you know, four years, five years, 10 years after I've worked with you, that you're a good human being, I've done my job. Yeah, and I'll just say about that. Hey, listen, we play to win. We train to win, baby. It's 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 all about you know you know doing our best and 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 winning. But when the bell is rung and the game is over and the scoreboard it says what it says, we move on. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Like we either enjoy it or we, yeah, you know, we we have we have to uh, you know go through some maybe downtime because we lost. But but then we move on and and we learned a lot of lessons along the way. You learn a lot more from your losses than your wins. You know. Yeah. Um, so. <laughs> So it's, it's really, it's a lesson. And, and you know what, at the end of the day, it's the memories you have. So like, don't get me wrong. I mean, we're really competitive. We train our athletes to be competitive. We, we train to win. Um, that's a, that's a, a trademark that that's a trademark that we own, you know, train to win. I mean, that's a, that's something that's really important to us. So, but, but, you know, you got to keep things in perspective, you know, you really do. Uh, and, and um, you know, Mark has been a big proponent of that. He's been a great, you know, great part of our organization for a long time. And, uh, you know, this, this was a great opportunity to kind of reminisce and share some, some information. Well, we appreciate you coming on, Bill. Um, where can people find out more about your school, find out more about your, the books that you wrote, uh, some of your philosophies? Yep. Yep. So Parisi school.com is, is our website. We also have uh, fascia training academy.com all about fascia. Um, we also oversee and work with the professional football coaches of the NFL. That's the PFSCCA.com, Professional Football Strength Coaches, Strength and Conditioning Coaches Association, uh, PFSCCA.com. Um, those are our are, are three uh, domains that we operate and, and support. Uh, there's tons of information on those domains about everything we shared, um, you know, from fascia to to information, uh, educational courses that we provide. There's a, there's a 20 hour incredible course on the professional football strength coaches site that's uh, available uh, for people to check out an injury resiliency course that was put together specifically uh, for the NFL strength coaches. Now it's a, it's available to the public. So tons of resources on, on those three sites, Parisi school.com, fascia training academy.com and PF as in Frank, S as in Sam, C, cat, C, cat, A, apple, P-F-S-C-C-A dot com. Thank you. I'm going to let Mark uh, take us out, but uh, I'd like to thank you for coming on. It's been an honor. Um, I know you're a busy man, but if uh, you got more stuff to talk about, I'm sure we would love to have you on again. Yep. Thank you. My pleasure, man. It was ha happy to be on, Chris. Bill, wow. I mean, talk about talk about athlete hacking yeah <laughs> and 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 really really putting a lot of information out there i can't thank you enough um like i said i came to you i didn't know what a mission statement was when i came to you you know i was like mission statement i, I need a mission statement for my life i just thought i'd work but then but then when i when i dove into it I, I realized how important having a mission statement is. It, it really gave me a rudder for the boat that is my life. You know, it gave me a direction. It gave me a path so I can be better every day and be the best person I can be on a daily basis. So I want to thank you for that. And I want to thank you for your continued help, support, and friendship. It means the world to me. Absolutely, man. It's my pleasure. And uh, any way I can help. And uh, I believe we're all servants in this world. And, and if, you, if you can leave this world giving more than you took, you left the world a better place. And, um, and if you leave this world taking more than you give, you probably, the, the world maybe didn't need you too much. Um, but if you can leave the world uh, giving more than you took, I think you did a great job and you made the world better. That's what I try to do. That's what you try to do. And it's a, it's a pleasure to do that. I think as you get older, more people realize there's, there's so much more satisfaction in giving. Um, and you know, that's, that's the best part of, uh, I think the holidays, right? Giving gifts to little kids and seeing their reaction and, you know, like, I mean, it's fun to do that as a, as a, as a 
industry educator. You know what I mean? It's really fun to get people excited about fascia. They get people excited about speed, no matter who they are, you know, um, it's just fun. So I think, we're, I think we're all cut from the same cloth. That's what you guys are doing with this podcast. So great job for doing it. Thanks for having me on. I'm glad we connected and, uh, man, you know, God bless you guys. Thank you so much. God bless you, man. Thanks for coming on. Okay. Take Everybody care, listening, uh, we are on YouTube, we are on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, a bunch of other ones. Uh, you can go to info at athletehackers.com if you want to be on the podcast or if you have questions. Peace from me. All my best. God bless. Get better every day. Getting better. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye. Take care, guys.